thank you all for coming and thank you for um, for taking this time uh, to talk with, uh, or take, thank you, Ron, for taking this time to talk with our students and to share your, your experiences moving from graduate to foreign service officer. This very much um, is something that some of our students are, are interested in and some of them are applying for scholarships that put them directly into uh, the foreign service. So um, this is really so timely and I am so grateful for this. So with that, I would like um, to hand it over to you um, for you to introduce yourself and maybe talk a little bit about your path and what you're doing and what you, how you got there. Okay, perfect. All right, well, my name is Ronald Tobin, uh, North Georgia, original class of 04. Um, currently, I'm at the U.S. Embassy in Seoul. Um, I'm on home leave. I just came from my second tour, which is Bangkok, Thailand. Um, my first tour was Frankfurt, Germany. So I should be in Seoul by September 8th to start my third tour. Um, interestingly enough, I sat with right where you guys were. The first time I applied for the foreign service was in Bonn, <laughs> So um, I literally sat where you guys were. So. <laughs> I can answer any and all questions on um, which path is the best to take. Luckily, there's so many different paths to get to the point of service um, because there's so many cones, there's so many uh, offerings, so many opportunities. Um, a lot of times you can get overwhelmed because you're looking at the numbers and the hiring rate and which way to go, which way to go, which way to go. But it's really what you figure out that there is a uh, perfect way, then you'll see, okay, every step that I take is uh, getting closer and closer. Um, I've served with people who were hired right out of college. I've served with people who had to work at the White House or the Peace Corps beforehand. So there's so many different routes that it doesn't knock anyone out. And that's the beauty of the foreign service. Um, like I said, I, I was hired, you know, I sit sat where you guys were. So, you know, it's 100% Questions do you have for Ron? I think you're muted, Philip. Oh, sorry, Philip. I muted you. Uh, it's all right. Uh, I have a few questions. Um, so I'll just start with like a basic one. Uh, what kind of a foreign service officer are you? I started off um, in the political cone and I went over to uh, the special side. After two years, um, I went to the diplomatic career route because I really wanted to see the world that way. Um, and I might go back over to the political, maybe in the next nine years, I'm not sure. It just depends on the climate and, and where I want to set up. Awesome. Um, I also have another question. How long is the process um, to become an FSO? It honestly depends on, I can give you an average, but it depends on the candidate. It depends on the candidate, it depends on hiring, it depends on congressional budget allocation, it depends on how many people are retiring, how many classes were hired. Luckily, you guys are the most perfect uh, cohort, as we call it, um, meaning within the next five to 10 years, um, one could possibly be because the Foreign Service right now, a lot of people are retired. And now Congress has given us so much money to hire people. I mean, I've never seen classes come out like this. To give you a, um, an example, my current position was only advertised on USA Jobs um, every two to four years. Right now, it's five times a year. I've never seen it. I've never seen it. Every cone, consular officers, uh, political management, you name it, the classes are just opening up. So you guys are nearly in the best possible place you could be. When I first tried, um, it didn't matter that I passed the test or did well at the uh, oral 
because there were no spots. You know, they were all filled. People weren't leaving. Now, oh, that's why I don't think you guys. <laughs> so, to answer your question, you take all, you take into account all of those variables and then you mix it with the average process, which is, um, I think the next test is October 20th. Um, you take the test and usually about uh, two to six weeks, you'll find out your results. And then the moment then you find out your results, then it's time to answer the personal amount of questions. Uh, and it's all judged by the, the two uh, panel, which takes about three weeks of the most excruciating waiting time in your life. Um, and after you get those results, then uh, main state headquarters will come back and look at their budget, look at their timing, and say, okay, we're going to schedule oil maybe a month, not two months. After your personal matter, after that, you'll be hired on the spot. That's the beauty about the State Department. Is the oral, the, the moment, the day that the oral is in, they'll invite you into a room and say, hey, congratulations, you're now part of the point. After that, that's when a real waiting game takes place. You immediately have to get your medical clearances to take two to three months um, or a month. Then you can. Um, then you'll have to do your uh, security clearance. Security clearance is the biggest way to get it because the pin, that depends on how many places you've been, how many people you've talked to, how many foreign nationals you've talked to, how many places you live, and that can be anywhere from six months to a year. Um, I've seen it done as fast as three months. It really depends on the person. And then after that, the State Department is the only agency that requires a suitability clearance. So you can work with DIA, CIA, NSA, you name it, and they'll just require a top secret security plan. Um, State Department says, okay, if you're going to be in foreign service, we need to know that you're suitable to live amongst other cultures, not in the sense of you won't break protocol as far as security or, you know, things of that nature, but how well have you been at adapting to different cultures, adapting to situations you're not used to. Um, because, let me give you an example. We just had to evacuate uh, the consulate in Chengdu. Um, most people would uh, be erratic if they got a call and they said, hey, you have to pack up your entire house in 45 minutes. <laughs> you know? um, but not as uh, FSO as the SFS. We don't because um, we follow composure. So that's what suitability is. So I would say the entire process from head to tail on the average face, everything was clear and everything was smooth, would probably be eight months to a year. So hopefully that answers your question. But I yeah, can't yeah. some good news because, uh, like I said, everything is be wide open and we're really recruiting, 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 we need it fast. So we, we're hiring um, more investigators for clearances and more for You know, we're trying to, you know, get, get, get the new officers in the industry. So that, that's a great news for you guys. You know? Well, thank you. That answers my question. No problem. No problem. All right. Other questions? Um, I actually had a sorry. question. Go ahead, Kate. Okay. Um, so I believe the diplomatic courier position is a specialist position. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. So was it difficult going from that FSO officer position to the specialist, or was it a relatively easy transition? Oh, no. It's, it's, easy. it's an easy transition just because um, everyone does it. Because usually... And the, the, how do I say this? The known secret is everyone's just trying to get their foot in the door. You know, so you're going to get in however you can. Um, so with me, luckily, I passed the test and went in, um, got on the register as a political, um, in the political cohort. That's what I wanted to do. Um, Due to timing and other different factors, I chose to go to the other side. Uh, so I said, I uh, will go back. So 
So it's relatively easy because everyone does it. You have people who, all right, I'm not going to uh, cavitate. Nine times out of ten, everyone wants to be political or economic. <laughs> you know, that's usually what happens. If you're, if you're a history major or poli sci, you want to get into the grip of being a diplomat, you know. Um, but a lot of times, you have so many people trying to get in it, create the log jam, so you say, hey, let me be a consular officer. Because while it's not easier to be a consular officer, it's easier to get the language so that they're going to automatically pull you in. Um, you guys are in the premier leadership institution in the country. Ma being, becoming a management officer will be totally easy for you guys because you have that leadership stamp behind your name. So say you want to be a political officer or an economic officer or even an FSS person. I'm North Georgia right now. I'm saying, hey, I'm going to go in as a management officer because I have that and maybe three to five years once you get tenured, then you can go over to uh, whatever tone you would like. It's, it's, it's pretty, it's, it's not super easy, but it's so common that it creates no issues a lot there. The key is to get in the door. <laughs> Oh, yeah, absolutely. Once in, and that's the beauty about the State Department. Once you're in the door, they understand you can go anywhere. It's funny because at the Foreign Service Institute, your first week, you spend the entire week finding this one paper over and over again that says, you will operate in any capacity that the United States needs. I've literally been, my, um, I've been the ambassador, I've been the head of the security officer, you know, it, your, your title, if they need you in a situation, you will be in that situation, you know. So uh, don't worry about specifically what you want to do. Worry about getting in the door. And then, you know, you can transfer over and do all that good stuff. Okay. All right, Maya, were you going to ask a question or... Uh, yes, I was. So you mentioned that you could uh, work with other agencies. What would work within like agencies that, like, you know, the CIA as a diplomat? What would that look like for you guys? Okay. Well, overseas, we're all one thing. You know, um, when you're dealing with the different in, uh, counterparts of the intelligence community, community you're all one thing. You know, um, a lot of it you can't really go into specifically with language, but you're gonna you're side by side with it. Uh, some embassies, like say uh, Bangkok, you're gonna be out direct state department personnel is actually outnumbered by different agencies. So within the different departments, you're gonna have a lot of DEA, a lot of DI, a lot of a lot of a lot of different agencies, so you're not separated at all. One hundred percent, you're not separated at all. You will find that out your first day of service once you get to the point of service institute. Um, we're all literally one family. Um, the name of the agency is just your designation of the mission, basically. If that makes sense. Great. Awesome. All right. Who else has a question? Um, I have a question. Great, go for it. Um, yeah. So my name's Melissa. Um, and so I had two questions actually. So you say um, in September you're going back to your country. What what country are you going to be posted at again? I forgot. I forgot what you said. And my second um, question is my my new. No, 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 no. You can answer. Okay, it. Go ahead. Um. Well. Uh, oh no, I was going to say uh, my new country. Oh, South Korea. <laughs> Sorry, I'll let you talk. <laughs> Oh, no, no, I was answering your question. I'm, I'm so sorry. Go ahead. Um, so you said, you know, um, while you're abroad, you know, everyone's like one big family. You work with like CIA people and then Foreign Service officers and whoever else is like within the embassy. Um, when you work with other departments, do you like know that, okay, that guy, he works with CIA. Okay, that girl, she's a political officer okay she works in public diplomacy like do you know where or is that uh well to answer your question yes and no yes depending on 
what you do. So when you're on the diplomatic security side of the of the uh, of the ball game, the, the intelligence side, you're going to know everybody. Um, but you're only going to know as much as you're supposed to know. Even what you do within State Department, you're only going to know as much as you're supposed to do. But um, if you're what we call direct hire, meaning you're 100% foreign service, like I am 100% um, foreign service institute, 100% State Department, when you work with the people, you know. You know they're going to introduce themselves in your class at uh, A100. Um, now, a lot of people don't know. Uh, and, and for operational security purposes, it has to be that way. You know, a lot of people who work at the embassy don't know. <laughs> you know, and uh, what a lot of particulars of my job, a lot of my colleagues who aren't in my department don't know. Uh, and it's just, this is basically operational security, and that, that works like that. That's a, a running nomenclature throughout the entire federal government, to be honest with you. Um, domestically, you know, domestically, it's easier to talk about because you're not really worrying about foreign interference and things of that nature. But overseas, uh, we try to definitely keep it um, tight. <laughs> yeah, I had a question. Go for it. Um, so the diplomatic courier route is actually the route I want to take. Um, and I didn't know you could do it as an FSO. Um, would you say there are any physical restraints regarding that position as I am 4'11 and 85 okay. pounds? Okay, well, um, number one, you can't do it as an FSO. You have to transfer over to be an FS6. But it happens all the time. They go back and forth because everyone wants to be a carrier. And, you know, they see the pictures of us in Paris and all the plays and, you know, you see the old movies and everything. And no, there aren't restrictions. I've met uh, one, um, it's funny, one, uh, one of the most storied couriers, I've served with her twice in Frankfurt and Bangkok. Yeah, I think she's 411. <laughs> As well, uh, she was actually uh, one of the first uh, female officers in the Air Force, uh, at the Air Force Academy, uh, Teddy. And man, she, she's a tough cat, and she can really, she can really make, make things move. So trust me, that wouldn't be any issue <laughs> whatsoever. Thank you so much. That was my question. <laughs> uh, you're welcome. All right, what else you got? Oh, Philip, go for it. Sorry, I also had another question. Um, so I'm assuming you don't have any like choice of where you want to go, but if there is, like, do you have any like? Oh, you do. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's my question there. All right. So every place I've asked for, I've gotten. It. Um, so it works like this uh, as far as. So depending on what you do, what tone you go into, whether it's FSO or FSS, particular job code, um, you're gonna bid. We have, every every summer or every winter we have what's called a bidding list. It's bidding time, and everyone arrives because you look at your position and you see what's open, and you bid based on what your particular position is and who's there and who's leaving. And say you put your bid list, and I don't know. Paris, uh, Azerbaijan, uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, or who else, blah, blah, blah. Everyone's going to go to Paris, right? That's what everyone wants. Now, if there's no one there and your position is open, you're going to get that choice unless someone has it out to you. <laughs> but um, pretty much, you can choose where you want to go, but they, they, they never lie to you because they will always say need the service, depending on need the so if I so I wanted to go to uh, Seoul, right? They need the service at Ronald. We'll give you Seoul, but we need you in uh, Kyrgyzstan because of so and so, so and so, so and so. I have to go, you know. But for the most part, every single person chooses where they want to go. Now, when you bid against 
five or ten other people, you know, who's the best? Depends on a lot of things. You know, your work throughout the year, um, say your language abilities, or you know, your family, or just or what what time you can arrive. There's so many different factors, but that's the one thing that's different from the military is you have a say in where you go. One hundred percent. Thank you. I have to follow up to that. Yeah. How, um, how many years can you stay at one post before you have to leave? Or how long do you stay at a post before you can uh, put it in? So every uh, tour has a uh, limit. You'll have a tour that's two years, you'll have a tour that's three years. Um, and you can always extend for, say, a year, and maybe another year, but you really try to get you out of there within four years. And that, in extreme case of they need you there, and you came up with a great, um, a great example of why you personally need to be there. But for the most part, every tour is two and three years. Now we all have to serve a domestic tour, um, and that's no more than six years. So you can be no more than six years in DC or Miami. But every post over two years, two or three years. So my next post of tour is three years. My last two posts in Frankfurt, Germany, and Bangkok, Thailand were two. Neat. All right. What other questions do you all have? Um, I have a question in terms of, um, do you guys hear me well? I want to make sure. Certainly. Okay. I'm in terms well. of, uh, <laughs> I'm good. How about you? Um, I have a question. Um, so I'm a linguist and I'm looking to um, go into you know, seeing my options for basically um, positions that are multilingual and then the government would be a great way to go. I know the CIA has interpreters and translators specifically for that. Is there anything that you know of that um, pertains to languages and culture, you know, specialties in general or anything like that? Every single agency in the, intelligence, in, in the intelligence community will literally kidnap you if you're a great, great leader. <laughs> because <Wow. laughs> it's extremely needed. Uh, uh, because you got to understand, um, even if you're a great analyst um, or you're a great whatever you do, you still have to go to the, in every agency will send you to language school and it could be eight months from here. If you can test over the telephone, on a 2 2 speaking and writing, or even a 3 2 speaking and writing, or a 4 4, you just save the US government so much money that they're not even going to waste time on someone else who may have more experience over you. Or because it's funny, one of my best friends who helped me um, go along with Ken Bond, who's a North Georgia graduate as well, he used to tell me all the time as I was applying and all the uh, intelligence agencies um, that they'll teach you. They'll teach you what you need to know. They're really smart. So they know you'll pick it up. They're going to spend a year trying to teach you this. So don't worry about not doing the job in particular. Worry about making yourself uh, the perfect candidate. So for you, Jay, if you're a linguist, I would completely work on becoming a 3-2 or 4-4 four, four speaker. You know what I mean by that? Um, as far as speaking and writing and how you get I do, yeah. I do it like that. Um, higher, the yeah. higher level of what you said. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. You do that, you can, really, you, you can write your own check. I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. And that's with everyone. Wow. Um, becoming, <laughs> going into the uh, foreign service, you do not, hear me out, you do not need to um, have language, languages. Does it help and teach you over people? 100%. I can't smell you on that. Um, but you do not need to because they'll teach you to you. Um, it's all about developing the assets for that particular cone or particular job that you want to go to. Um, so did that answer your question? It did. That was well, Look at the critical needs too. Oh, look yes. I, yes. I, um, yes. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> I would definitely do that. I think I already no speak two of those, so that would be great. Thank you so much. <laughs> What's that? What's that? <laughs> what are those languages? 
Oh, um, Portuguese and Korean. Definitely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, and I love those. So that's great. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right. Ah, right, <laughs> I'm going to just uh, brag on a lot of the students. Because I'm new uh, uh, Sorry. <laughs> um, just to brag on a lot of the students in the call, most are critical language speakers, which is, is pretty exciting. Um, Melissa was in Kyrgyzstan. Excellent. Yeah. Philip speaks Japanese. Uh, Julia speaks uh, Chinese. And Maya, I think that you're in critical languages too, but I can't remember what you're... No? Okay. So, yeah. Well, it looks like I'm going to see you all over the with me. I love it. <laughs> yeah, I love it. I love it. That's how you do it. Mm -hmm. Yep. And just remember, um, that probably 80% of making yourself um, pull away from the pack, basically. Because it's funny, the first week in the Forest Service Institute, after you get hired in your first hire date, you're sitting in this auditorium at A100 and like, all these people. And before class starts, um, you're talking with everyone. And the first thing they tell you is, um, you know, do not get imposter syndrome because you're literally going to hear everything that these people have done. And they're going to think, why oh, the heck am I here? So I thought, um, but you realize it's not what you've done, um, it's what you've done to make yourself of value to the current role of the State Department or the current role of uh, the Social Intelligence Agency or the current role of the NSA. So you'll have people, I remember in my class, I had people who came straight out of the White House, straight out of, you know, one guy was the um, dean of Stanford, the other, you know, all of these amazing NASA, you know, all these astronauts, and all these crazy people, and you also had um, uh, a student who just came right out of undergrad, you know, another student that came right out of undergrad, and you're like, what is, <laughs> you know, you got this one guy who pretty much worked for Clinton, literally, who was his NSA advisor, and, and you got this student who's a poli sci or history major who's right out of school, and you're like, okay, what's the difference? No, you don't look at the difference. You look at what they both did. They target a particular job. Whether it was diplomatic courier, whether it was economic officer, whether it was uh, security engineer officer, management, GSO, you name it. And they literally built their entire profile around that and the need of service, i.e., critical languages. If you're studying um, Korean and Portuguese, well, guess what? You also need to, um, to be on the lookout for uh, anything, any type of political forum or event or virtual uh, program online that deals with the Eastern Asia Pacific region, Korea, America. You want to tag yourself um, for the people who speak, um, you know, I think I heard Mandarin and Russian, then you need to not only hit the, the linguistics of that, but you need to pad your classes around that. You know, that's what I did. Um, it's funny, it's First of all, is Dr. Justice still at Missouri? Yes. Okay. Yes. So Dr. Justice, um, I took um, once I figured out I I got hurt, so I wasn't going to commission um, my senior year, and that's when I figured out I wanted to be State Department. Um, I took a class studies in U.S. diplomacy. Ironically, I got a D. <laughs> I laugh at that all the time, but um, um. In the class, I, I learned about, uh, you know, all it entails to be a diplomat. And once again, I, I didn't even know what I was doing as far as my roadmap to how I was going to get there. But I knew, okay, if I say that I'm an analyst that wants to be a diplomat, I need to focus on a particular region, and I need to build myself around that region, Middle Eastern. I need to take Middle Eastern courses. I need to learn the Middle Eastern languages. I need to uh, go to different events that around, uh, you know, there's plenty of conflicts in Atlanta. You know, I just, I'm going back and forth doing work from the State Department at the Korean conference, right now I'm teaching, you know, so you want to look at events that they do, so you can just put that on that resume, so as soon as you send it in, State Department's going to look at it and say, okay, 
I don't care that this person worked 15 years for the White House for defense intelligence agency. Um, I got um, these kids from North Georgia who not only know the languages, but they've been to the conference. They they've padded these classes. You know, they they've done everything they can do specifically around what they want to do, and we're going to take them. So you want to keep that in mind. That that I would say. If I could go back in time to where I was sitting in Barnes Hall trying to figure this thing out for myself, that's the first thing I would tell myself. Stop what you're doing and plan everything straight down the line of the cone that you want to go to. And that's how the undergraduate got in before the person who spent 15 years in the White House and NASA is because they spent this time doing all these wonderful, amazing things and their resume read like Ulysses. That's how my resume read. <laughs> Instead of just a straightforward Moby Dick. I want to get this well. I'm going to spend the rest of the night talking about getting this well. <laughs> you know, and that's what you want to do. You know, I'm really glad you say that because <laughs> we talk a lot in the scholarship <laughs> applications with all of our students and all of you have heard us say this, I think. Um, that inevitability, right? We want you all to have this trajectory that we can mm -hmm. kind of plot out. Um, so I promise you, I did not plant that, y'all. I didn't plant that. That was not <laughs> like that was not prearranged. <laughs> but yeah, no, I, I, I could I not birth. I could not. not. If I could go back in time to me sitting in Barnes Hall <laughs> with the Foreign Service application on my desk, I would. Set it and say, listen, find your target and just constantly shoot at that target and that's the easy way to get it. <laughs> and I think what's been so, what's so interesting about the students who are here and so many who are uh, applying for these different scholarships and opportunities is that's exactly what they're, they're doing. They're building that resume of, of inevitability, of, of having the language as well as knowledge of traditions and um, practices, beliefs politics historically and today so um that's really just yeah, cool. because and i'm pretty sure you guys all know about the 13 dimensions by now right the 13 dimensions of the state department um that's literally what they judge you against from the time you apply to every year that you're in to how you get promoted to how you get tenure the 13 dimensions if you can literally match every dimension with what you're doing every single day to get in the State Department, you will be the fastest one there because that's the only way they judge you. Um, you'll have people uh, spending all their time uh, trying to do this or that or do this, do that, and they're not applying the 13 dimensions to So if you're taking a class, um, say, I don't know, what's a, what's a good class, Middle Eastern Studies, well, you should be able to say, come up with an example of how you show composure, cultural adaptability, you know, research, substantial knowledge, knowledge, all of this. If you went to, I don't know, a uh, cultural food festival um, that featured, um, say, Russian food or something of that nature, you should be able to match one of the 13 dimensions to that, cultural adaptability. You know, you were able to blah, blah, blah. So 13 dimensions is literally how you get in. It's how you get promoted. It's how, luckily, I got I got tenure in my first year at this post. Um, usually takes you about four to five years. Luckily, I got it in my first shot um, because I was able to still remember State Department judges you by the 13 dimensions. If you use that against every single thing you do, use each other. Uh, create a... Uh, I did a political forum, I kid you not, um, I did a political forum with my fraternity at um, North Georgia, and I used it for one of my 13 dimensions. <laughs> you know, I actually used a couple of things that I did on that campus to get, to get in the foreign service. So you literally could be doing it now. You know, you could write, uh, everybody knows what a white paper is, like a, say a, a, a research um, paper, a policy. So um, right now, you guys could get together, I kid you not, and say, okay, let's write a white paper 
on any topic you want, any research uh, analysis that you want that you think uh, maybe, I don't know, uh, Syria, Putin, you name it. And guess what? You all just got together and did one of the first interventions. You just worked together, you, you, you did substantiated knowledge, you did cultural adaptability, you did all of that. So you want to create it now. You use each other. That's what me and my friend Santa did. He was a diplomatic capacity. We use each other. We were the only two at North Georgia who wanted the lifestyle, so all we could is use each other. We both got in. So use each other, trust me. Create something right now. <laughs> Um, just so you can mark it down and say you did it, and that will get you in uh, because you did it. And guess what? Everything that I created to get into the State Department actually helps me out daily, and that's literally the entire purpose. The entire purpose of it, you know? Awesome. All right. Are any last questions for Ron? Yeah, I have one actually. Go for it. Um, so lay it on me, please. How hard is the FSOT? Okay. <laughs> so we all know it's like Jeopardy, basically. Um, I've passed it, I failed it. I've passed it, I failed it. I've passed it and failed it. So it's not hard, it's how you study for it. And it's the amount of people that taking it and how high the score they get. So to study for it, so to, 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 make it, to make it easy for you, studying for it is easy because there are so many guides that's out there. Yahoo used to have the most perfect guide that's still archived. You can go on that. That's how I passed it. Um, Reddit now has um, great guides. You just Google search the FSOC, FSOA. You, all of us are all over it. The, the main treasure trove besides the Yahoo group Reddit is the form in careers.state.gov. Um, I actually uh, went to Barnes and Noble and studied off of the federal guide that they keep in Barnes and Noble. So it's not that hard at all, to be honest with you. Um, you just have to study for it. It's going to be overwhelming because you're going to say, oh my God, how much knowledge is one person supposed to know? Because it is Jeopardy. I'm not going to lie to you. It is Jeopardy. So you have to, you're going to study probably 5,000 things and only 800 of them show up on the thing. Um, so it's not that hard, but it doesn't mean that it's easy if that makes sense. You, know, you do have to put in the work because you've got a lot of, a lot of brilliant people taking that test. You know. But luckily, they only judge you. Just the passing against the people who take it, the time you take it. Um, to give you an example, I passed with a 154 and I failed with a 168. <laughs> you know, um, so it all depends on how many people are taking it and how well you do this person. What do you mean by pass, fail, pass, fail? Are you saying you took it more than once? Oh yeah, I took the uh, most people. I've only known maybe a maybe two percent of the people I've met in the embassy who only took the who took it and passed it the first try. Um, and keep in mind, even when you're on the register, because you're looking at how many people get in. You may have so okay. So when I was first to answer the question on the original question was uh, the transfer over from FSO to FSS. I transferred over because when I was a political, on the political uh, register, you know, you had, what, 229 people on there, and there were maybe only 30 open slots. You have two years for them to call your number. So what most people do is say you get on there and you're 175. You're going to take it every time so you can get up, because you can be on the register multiple times. So I was on the register like three different times. I had most people I know is going to register two or three times. So that every time you can go down. So you can occupy the 175 spot, the number 22 spot, the number four spot. Or if, say, you're on the register as a political officer, economic officer, or a management officer, but you see that um, diplomatic theory or SEO or uh, GSO has only has 50 different open spots, hey, you're going to 
trying to get, they're going to take the test so you can get into the GSO slot. Because the whole point is to get in the door so that you can, you know, go wherever you want, but you have to get in the door. So it's a game. That's another thing I wish I would have told myself when I was sitting in the hall, is that most people constantly take it. Even if you pass it eight out of eight times, say you're looking at the time and you're like, man, it's been a year and my number, my number hasn't been called and you can see your, your rankings. And you call your um, diplomatic uh, diplomatic resident, um, who was actually supposed to be calling me back, uh, Mr. Allen uh, Dubos, have you guys talked to him? He's actually down the street, uh, situated at Morehouse College. Yeah, he's a diplomat in residence. He's over uh, Georgia, Tennessee, and the South. He, so I'm going to um, speak with him to do something with you guys. Um, I spoke with him about two hours before this meeting. But um, you're calling them to see, okay, where's my ranking? Where's my ranking? Where's my ranking? And you're like, okay, I need to be lower because I know maybe Congress is going to say, Congress is going to do what happened to me the first time, a shutdown. <laughs> so I came in later because of shutdown, uh, delayed my clearance, delayed everything, and I had to try again. It was the worst thing ever, but, you know, it, it is what it is. So definitely take the test more than one. Unless you take the test and you, your ranking is number one, which you guys can very well be because you're all linguists. <laughs> so, I mean, the linguist part is the money maker, you know. So, if you have that, then I highly doubt your rankings will be so uh, high that you need to take the test, the test again. Especially um, knowing that a lot of people are hiring now as far as in the foreign service. Um, back in my day when I took it, I was not only going to get people trying to get in, but the fact that there weren't even slots open. Whereas now, <laughs> It's locked everywhere. So, you know, it's great news for you guys, 100%. Great news. Um, every, put it this way, every negative variable that I dealt with, you guys won't have to deal with. Because you're just in a perfect time to join this foreign service. Absolutely perfect time. So, you need to try to study this. <laughs> Um, so to be a diplomat, uh, to be a diplomat in residence, um, do you have to serve like abroad like years and then you can be a, like in residence or how does that work? Yeah. So it's funny, um, the diplomat in residence in Atlanta two years ago was my teacher in A100 <laughs> at, uh, Foreign Service Institute. Um, so it's usually, um, for people who either are about to retire or people who uh, are looking for a stepping stone to work at uh, the seventh floor at Maine State, which is the Holy Grail. That's the seventh floor is where the uh, Secretary of State, and, you know, that's where all policy is made. So to be a diplomat and resident, heck, I might want to be one. Um, I'm thinking about um, it, but that's going to be down, 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 down the line. Because I think Alan Dubos, who's, the, who's your current diplomat resident, I think he did 15 years on the thing in the point thirty. So that's definitely not retirement, retirement age unless you shoot to. You know. All right. Any last questions? No? All right. We don't have them now. Like I said, I will be uh, at Christ Memorial at 9 a.m. tomorrow. And I would be on campus, so uh, uh, if you want to stop oh, bye. by. I'm in Price. I'll say hi. And to you. Okay, and I definitely, Victoria, are you going to be there tomorrow? I'll be on campus, uh, but I'm in, I'm in Barnes. <laughs> okay, okay, yeah. Well, I'm going to be all over. Um, so, uh, yeah, if you have any questions or you want to meet with me personally, See you guys tomorrow unless you have any more questions now. All right. Well, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. No, thank you thank so you. much. Thank you. Thank you. No problem. No problem. It's been so useful.